it was like in the green room you guys were already like just going for it and yeah <laughs> like one hour is just not enough you know <laughs> it's a big talk but oh it's it, big talk for a big chunky book big <laughs> chunky book <laughs> all right so um all right so i have 501 and we'll let everyone start coming in but I'm going to start now. Um, but good evening, everyone. My name is Isa, and I am a bookseller at Paul Dixon Throws Bookstore, and I'll be your host for the evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to PNP Live. Thanks for joining us in this virtual format amid these unpredictable times throughout all of which we strive to continue to bring you the authors you love and their new books to the politics and prose community. At any point during the event, you can click on the link in the chat to purchase... Um, the, oh, there you go, there we go, <laughs> The Method by Isaac Butler on the Politics and Prose website. And I just want to let everyone know that we actually have book plates for this. And additionally, you can ask the author a question by clicking on Q&A, which can be found near the bottom of your screen. And while we'll try to get to everyone's questions after this presentation, we apologize in advance if we do not have time to get to yours. And finally, we want to thank everyone for being here with us tonight. We are so thankful for our community of friends and loyal customers for keeping our spirits afloat. So it is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Isaac Butler is the co-author of The World Only Spins Forward, The Ascent of <laughs> Angels in America, which NBR named one of the best books of 2018. Butler's writing has appeared in New York Magazine, Slate, The Guardian, American Theater, and other publications. For Slate, he created and hosted Lend Me Your Ears, a podcast about Shakespeare and politics, and currently co-hosts Working, a podcast about the creative process. His work as a director has been seen on stages throughout the United States, and he is the co-creator with Darcy James Argue and Peter Negrini of Real Enemies, a multimedia exploration of conspiracy theories in the American psyche, which was named one of the best live events of 2015 by the New York Times and has been adapted into a feature length film. In conversation with Isaac will be Glenn Weldon, host of NPR's Pop Culture Happy Hour podcast. He reviews books, movies, comics, and more for the NPR Arts Desk and is the author of two cultural histories, Superman, the unauthorized biography and The Cape Crusade, Batman and the Rise of Nerd Culture, and most recently, NPR's Podcast Startup Guide, Create, Launch, and Grow a Podcast on Any Budget. Weldon has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the New Republic, the Atlantic, Slate, McSweeney's, and so much more. And he is also the recipient of an NEA Arts Journalism Fellowship and an Amtrak Writers Residency, a Ragdale Writing Fellowship, and the Pew Fellowship in the Arts for Fiction. Everyone, Please join me in welcoming Isaac and Glenn to PNP Live. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I guess I'm going to start by reading a little of the book. Please do. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to say before we start, uh, thank you so much for attending this reading. And it's really special to be doing an event with uh, Politics and Prose, which was my childhood bookstore. I've been going there since before the coffee shop was in the building. <laughs> uh, uh, that's how long I've been going there. And um, just means a lot to me to do an event with them and to do an event again with Glenn, uh, whose cardigans I am always jealous of. Um, I'm gonna read to you a little bit uh, from the book. Uh, I'm trying to read a different section of the book at each one of these. We'll see, uh, so, so this is a new one. Um, and uh, I think all you really have to know about this is that, um, you know, the group theater, which is where the method is born uh, and out of which comes uh, a lot of very famous and important people in theater and film, including Harold Clerman, Stella Adler, Lee Strasberg, Sanford Meisner, and uh, Aaliyah Kazan, Clifford Odets, et cetera, uh, has split up. <laughs> it, uh, and now we fast forwarded a few years into the early 1940s. And a lot of these folks have started um, their careers as acting teachers. And this section is about a, a rather important student of one of theirs. So here we go. Acting was never Marlon Brando Jr.'s passion. The man who, despite his protestations, would define method acting in the public imagination for the next 30 years, dreamed instead of being a jazz drummer. There is something in him that resents acting, Harold Clerman, who came to know him better than most, recalled, yet he cannot help being an actor. Brando's gifts were a kind of curse. He was so natural as an actor that he never needed to take it very seriously, and so gifted that he could never escape it. 
escape from digging ditches from his fragile alcoholic narcissistic mother from his overbearing abusive controlling father was on his mind when he moved to new york in the 1940s as a child he responded to the fraught world of his parents with a mischievous sense of humor but as he became a teenager his refusal ever to do as he was told got him in trouble again and again eventually he washed out of high school and wound up at shattuck military academy which his father had also attended there someone finally noticed his potential Earl Wagner, the head of Shattuck's English department and a barely closeted gay man who directed the school's plays. Everyone called him Duke. Duke directed Brando in A Message from Khufu and was impressed and took Brando under his wing, casting him in plays and tutoring him in English. The two had a mysterious falling out in 1943, one that Brando refused ever to explain. There was speculation at Shattuck and beyond that either Duke had made a pass at Brando and been rebuffed or that the two began a relationship that soured. Either is possible. Duke was known to take advantage of his students at Shattuck and Brando had affairs with men as well as women. Brando would not last much longer at the school. In May, he decided to sneak off campus and was expelled. Students went on strike demanding his reinstatement, but Brando had decided to make his own way in the world. His sister Jocelyn was already in New York, studying at the American Academy of Dramatic Art. Marlin persuaded his father that he could make a go of it too. On Jocelyn's recommendation, he applied to Irwin Piscotter's dramatic workshop. His father agreed to pay his tuition for one year. Soon, Marlin had moved to New York and begun taking classes with Stella Adler. In the basement of the new school building at 66 West 12th Street, which is actually the building I teach in, so that's kind of cool, Stella tried by force of will to shape her students into artists worthy of what to her was the noblest of professions. Her first tool was her own grand performance. Adler's persona was that of an aristocrat deigning to give you the secrets of her own nobility so long as you proved your worth to her. Elegantly coiffed, dressed to the nines, Stella did not enter a classroom. She made an entrance into it. Man, a student of hers recalled, there was a woman who read her own publicity. I don't know how to describe it. She was 7,000 feet over the top and you knew it. And yet it was fabulous beyond words. After the entrance came the lecture. In her heightened mid-Atlantic accent, she would pronounce a bold aphorism. You must listen with your blood and build from there into a stem-winding tour of some aspect of the actor's art. Olivier could stand on his head, but he can't be you. Only you can be you. What a privilege. Nobody can be you, and nobody can reach what you reach if you do it. So do it. We need your voice, your body. We don't need for you to imitate anybody because it will be second best. Stella's extravagance extended to her criticism, particularly when the student was a woman. Anything less than great acting was a betrayal of the things she cared about most in the world. Berating her students was the norm. You went back to the crap, the dirt, the filth, the indecency of showing your acting, she said to one after watching a scene. It's worse than being a whore. She went on, her voice rising, hectoring the student before turning on a dime to mock sweetness and asking him, Am I being mild? Marlon loved her. Stella taught me all I know. She took me under her wing and is responsible for any acting ability I have, he later said. Brando needed looking after and he needed encouragement. He had been told all his life that he wasn't smart, largely due to his dyslexia. As a result, he had never nurtured his considerable intellect. He was a Midwestern goy, a taciturn son of a traveling salesman. He didn't fit into the very brainy, very activist, very Jewish milieu of the new school. I don't understand life, he wrote home at the time, but I am living like mad anyhow. Adler noticed Brando immediately, his gift for mimicry and voices, his protean physicality, his ability to respond to unexpected stimulus while remaining in the moment, and most of all, his chaotic, oblique response to instruction. In one class, she told him to be a father holding his newborn son. He held the pantomimed baby with casual indifference, looking around the room, and then handed the invisible bundle to a female student and walked away. Another story so often retold that it might as well be on his tombstone involved a group improvisation in which the class pretended to be farm animals. Brando played a chicken. In some versions of this story, so did everyone else. Either way, at some point in the midst of their walking around an imaginary barnyard, Adler told the class that an atomic bomb was about to fall. Everyone else in the class started running around, flapping their wings, clucking, displaying animal panic. But Brando waddled over to an invisible nest 
and sat on some imaginary eggs. What did a hen know about the bomb? Uh, Adler stressed to her students that everyone acts all day, all the time. She was teaching them a method by which they could do what they already did automatically in a more considered and more reproducible way. This approach unlocked something in Brando. He also had been performing all the time, whether he was seducing new friends and sexual partners, telling tall friends and telling tall tales and holding court, or engaging in the hijinks he got up to when bored. Soon, Brando is dating Stella's daughter, Ellen, borrowing books from the Adler household and spending his time with Stella, Harold, and their friends. Money was tight for the Adler Clermans and would remain so until Harold returned to directing on Broadway. Adler once complained to him that he hadn't given her any jewelry in a long time. But Stella, Harold said, don't you realize I have debts amounting to $20,000? A man of your stature, she said, should be in debt for $100,000. They might not have been well off, but Stella and Harold's household was a place where at any moment some jumble of famous composers, intellectuals, writers, and actors might drop by for dinner. It was also home to Stella's mother, Sarah, as formidable an old woman as could be found at the five boroughs. Clerman described her as a woman of strong constitution, of energy, will, and hard sense. When she first met Marlon, she told Ellen, he's a bum. Stella disagreed and began talking Marlon up to everyone who would listen, and the industry began to take notice after his performance in a dramatic workshop production of The Assumption of Hanel. He even received an offer of a film contract, but Stella cautioned him against going to Hollywood before he could go on his own terms. While Marlon loved Stella, studying with Stella, he could not abide Erwin Piscotter and the feeling was mutual. In 1944, Piscotter fired Brando from a summer theater he ran in Sayville, Long Island, and Brando struck out on his own. Soon, thanks in part to Stella's championship, he made his Broadway debut in John Van Druten's I Remember Mama. Within a decade, he would win his first Academy Award and become the most famous and controversial actor in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. That was fantastic. Uh, Thank you. Three things occur to me. Uh, number one, I was today years old when I learned how to pronounce Kazan's first name correctly. Give it to me again. Aaliyah. And can I tell Aaliyah. you a funny story about that? Please do. Uh, uh, you know, doing the audiobook, I narrated the audiobook, which means I finally had to learn how to pronounce all <laughs> these words that had been in my head uh -huh. while for the years that I was writing the book. And it turns out, A, I had the pronunciation of every single Russian word wrong. Uh, uh, B, I had no idea how to pronounce Erwin Piscotter. And mm -hmm. C, I was really unsure about how to pronounce Kazan's name. And so I contacted his, the, his heirs to ask. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was told that there is not a consensus okay. in the Kazan family as to how his name is pronounced. But wow. it, it's usually Aaliyah or Ilya. And so okay. Ilya is what I went with. But in my head, it's always been Ilya because yeah, often that's what Orson Welles says in that, you know, there's that recording where Orson Welles is yelling about how much he hates him. Uh, uh -huh. he Ilya. So, but yeah. I mean, it's fitting that a guy that's involved with a method wouldn't, there wouldn't be agreement on how to pronounce his name. <laughs> totally. It's fitting. It, it, the other, my second point was going to be that everybody watching this right now should buy the book from our friends at Politics and Prose Union, yes. Uh, but they should also clearly... Uh, go for the audiobook because that was great. You did a great Thank job you. with that. Thank That's you so much. Thank you. And Thank you. the the third thing I want to say is it's fitting that you you chose an excerpt about Brando because as you say he represents the method in the public imagination. And one thing you learn very quickly in this book is that the public imagination of what the method is, is completely wrong. To yeah. in the public mind, it's Robert De Niro gaining sixty pounds. It's what's my motivation. It's uh, it's Daniel Day Lewis insisting on being called Lincoln. It's Benedict Cumberbatch being a jerk to Kirsten Dunst, it's Jared Leto and his whole bag of BS, uh, being a jerk to his castmates, actors being a jerk. It's kind of, yeah. <laughs> if we had to find a through line. Men, but, uh, men, it's almost, very specifically. Men, that's a very good point. Uh, but it's almost the opposite of that, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a weird thing, you know, the methods, what the public thinks the method is keeps changing over the course of its life. Mm -hmm. And that's part of, that was one of the most fun things about the book for me as a writer is to track that. You know, right. how does it, how does its definition keep changing in the public eye? Why does it keep changing in the public eye? And, uh, you know, I'm a descriptivist at heart, so shifts in definitions are interesting to me. Um, yes, yeah, so if you, there's sort of a public definition of the method and a private or expert definition of the method. The public definition of the method is exactly what you described. Um, and, and it ropes in a lot of people who, uh, 
during their own life have said very explicitly, I'm not a method actor, uh, right. including Marlon Brando and Robert De Niro. Um, there was that recent great profile of Jeremy Strong, where Jeremy Strong says in the profile, I am not a method actor. And yet if mm -hmm. you read coverage of it from other places, they call him a method actor. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, people talking about their profile. That so the thing that you've described, that public thing, is, is very much about an intense process of research that often involves some form of real physical activity and transformation, gaining weight, putting on prosthetics, mastering an accent, uh, you know, et cetera, living in a wheelchair for six months, um, and then refusing to break character on set. That, right? That's not the method. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that if you went to a method acting class, you would learn a completely opposite thing, that is about starting at the inside and with the self and your memories and your own idiosyncrat idiosyncrasies as a person mm -hmm. and um, developing those in such a way that you can bring those to the character, right? So one goes this way and one goes that way, but they both have their roots in the same place actually, which is they're both sort of taking different things that, Constantine Stanislavski, different ideas that he developed, and mm -hmm. then running with them as extremely as possible. Um, mm -hmm. And the goal remains the same with both of those, which is this idea of experiencing, which in Russian, the word is perjavanya. Um, and it means this moment when the actor, it's not that they're going crazy and thinking they really are the character, but it's when on some level they've so entered the imaginative reality of the character that they are feeling and thinking what the character is feeling and thinking while still mm -hmm. able to do their jobs. Right. It's an attempt to um, formalize your the access to emotion or yes. uh, to allow um, inspiration on command, which of course is in a contradiction in terms, but that's, yeah. that's where we are. Uh, now you mentioned you had your own brush with this. You were an actor, uh, yeah. you studied acting. Mm -hmm. can, do, do you know, first of all, can, can you now see, or did you know then which tradition you were studying in? Did you know who, who, who the main so, proponent, I, I guess, would be? Yeah, I knew that I was studying Stanislavski. I okay. knew that that was where it came from. It wasn't called The Method, among other things. Uh, the place where I studied, which for you DC people was the Studio Theater Acting Conservatory, mm -hmm. uh, uh, studying with the late, great John Emmert uh, mm -hmm. and Nancy Paris. Um, uh, the lineage of that is actually this woman named Elvina Krauss, who taught at Northwestern. She mm -hmm. taught uh, a, a whole generation of actors and directors at Northwestern, including Joy Zinnemann, who founded the Studio Theater. And she had her own take on Stanislavski. So it, that was sort of the lineage that I was going in. But I didn't know that it came from Elvina Krauss until I started working on this book and I ran into Joy uh, and I asked her and she said, oh, it's this. Um, okay. So, um, uh, but yeah, I did not know the lineage, but it we did do um, exercises among the many things we did um, were exercises aimed at using your own experience and your own emotional memories mm -hmm. uh, uh, to be able to summon those emotions on command should you need them, right. for sure. And in, and in the introduction, you talk about one point when you decided maybe acting wasn't for you because you went to a dark place and, and didn't yeah. find, it, find it difficult to come out of. Can you talk about, about that a little yeah. bit? Yeah, absolutely. So this was freshman year of college. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, as soon as I got there, I'm going to brag for, I was, I was a lead in the show as soon as I got there. But no, I was, I was cast okay. as uh, the Eric Bogosian role in talk radio, which okay. if you've seen the film talk radio or read the play, um, <laughs> here's the role in a, in, a, in a nutshell. You're playing a talk radio host, you're chain smoking for 90 minutes. And at about minute 75, you have a nervous breakdown during a five minute monologue. And you never leave the set. That's mm -hmm. that's the that's the so um, and you know I'd had a couple years of sort of this Stanislavski based acting training. I, I probably needed a lot more than that to be able to do this role. And it was student directors who had never directed a play before. I mean, it was you know it was a student production of Black Box Theater with two weeks of rehearsal, and so I really spent a lot of time trying to kind of get in touch with that inner darkness with the. I don't know, the insecurities, my own insecurities, my own yeah. pain, my own depression, which at the beginning of freshman year of college, one's pain and depression is usually pretty high. Uh, um, you know, I teach college freshmen now, so I see it yeah. happen in real time. Um, 
And I would just like really bring all of that out. And then at the same time, I was really chain smoking. They weren't mm. prop cigarettes. They were real cigarettes. So it was like 15 cigarettes over the course of the, the show. And yes. so I was feeling physically ill mm -hmm. and whipping myself into this frenzy every night. And so I would just wander around like dazed when the show was over. Like I couldn't talk to people. My stomach was upset. I would just feel miserable. Mm -hmm. um, and I would often uh, go back to my dorm room and like over my computer was just a blank center block wall painted white, you know, mm -hmm. as dorm rooms do. And I would just literally stare at that wall and just wait until myself reasserted itself. And it would take a while. And, you know, friends would tell me they were worried about me having watched the show and, and stuff like that. I, I'm pretty sure that, I mean, I started acting like the character out of rehearsal, not intentionally, but it started sure. happening. So it was kind of a prick. And yeah. so uh, when all of that was done, I was like, oh, I'm not, I'm just not tough enough to do this. Like uh -huh. I realized how tough you actually have to be to be an actor and I wasn't tough enough to do it. And so I, I, I stopped thinking myself as an actor and started pursuing directing almost on the spot. Where you can be mean as a profession and, and you know, that's, yeah. nobody cares. I'm a, very, I'm a very kind, I'm a of very course, kind director. Of course you are. Um, uh, you needed Lawrence Olivier to kind of poke over your shoulder and say, well, boy, have you tried acting? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Really and then he could put a prosthetic nose on. And... That's right, exactly. Uh, one of the things I admire most about this book, Isaac, is your dedication to always providing a meaningful social context around this approach, because the approach shifts, right? Mm -hmm. uh, depending, and, and one of the great things about the book is we can see how these different approaches are acting uh, to acting arise out of things like the Russian Civil War, the Depression. They react to it. The the post war mm -hmm. era of uh, I like Ike conformity, the Red Scare. That's because you approach this very explicitly as a biography of the method itself. How did you hit upon that approach? Well, some of it came from that thing that we were talking about earlier of, you know, its definition keeps changing. It seems to be, there's certain ideas at its core that do not change. Mm -hmm. Experiencing is one of them, that um, development of the human being of the artist who is an actor, uh, it, it, uh, like development of the self is the development of the art. Those are, those are intertwined. Mm -hmm. That acting is an art, you know, like these, that, that the inner life of an artist can be trained you know, th there are certain core convictions that remain the same and they're very revolutionary, um, but it still has a life. It still keeps transforming itself. It still has this interrelationship between the outside world and itself for the individuals who surround it. And the more and more I looked at that story, the more I was like, this feels more like a person's life than an idea's life. And so mm -hmm. I started thinking about that as a, as a way to structure it and a way to answer certain formal questions while doing it. I mean, I'm sure you know this as you've written a lot more than I have, but you know, often, especially in nonfiction anyway, the tyranny of the blank page, that moment of writer's block is actually that you have too many different ideas. It's Absolutely. a kind of choice paralysis. And so mm -hmm. I've always found that coming up with a few quick rules is a really good way to get over that. And then if the rules don't work, you throw them out and you find new ones, but you know, sure. um, and that turned out to be one that worked really well and a really good way to try to focus on plot. Cause I really felt like if the plot was compelling and well-structured, that would pull the reader along in such a way that you could fold in all these ideas and history and theory, some of which is quite complicated and they mm -hmm. would still feel compelled and excited to read it, which was really, really my goal, you know, was to have it feel alive and like you are there while also having all these ideas come in so that you don't get too, you don't ever feel too bogged down. Right, I mean, I, I can relate to that because the, the challenge you have and the thing that makes the book live, I think for me is that, you have chronology, this happened, then this happened, then this happened. But if you just do that without finding a through line, without finding the thread, you are writing a 75,000 page uh, Wikipedia entry. Exactly, and that's, yeah. this, there's no point to that. So it's important, it's more important to know what to leave out than it is to, to kind of have to keep in. And um, believe me, I left out so I can much. Imagine. I can only imagine. <laughs> uh, some, and some of that was very, very heartbreaking. You know, I mean, I would say, I mean, there's stuff that I never even wrote about to begin with, right? right. And then there's the like 30,000 words cut during the acting, mm -hmm. during the editing process, you know? Of course. So there was a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, at one point, my editor was like, you really like ekphrasis. 
and you don't always <laughs> need to describe in detail the plot of each of the, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Yep. So yeah, no, that was definitely trying to figure out, you know, um, whose life story you go into, whose you don't, you know, mm-hmm. which things you don't resolve because they don't really matter because, and just trying to keep the eye on the ball of it's the story of the method mm-hmm. and the people are actually secondary, et cetera, you know, is right. really it's, it's very clear how much research you did, but it is also very clear. Another thing I admire about the book is how you follow the research and when it leads you to a place that is unknowable, mm-hmm. you are transparent about the fact that, that that is unknowable. You don't put your thumb on the scale. And that's important because the history of the method is a, a series of schisms. It's people disagreeing. Totally. It's people offering differing accounts. Uh, Stanislavski versus Navarovich, uh, Strasberg versus Adler. So Adler, can we talk can we kind of break it down just give everybody the basic definition what is Strasbourgian what is Adlerian what's uh Meisnerian yeah Yeah, I mean those are the three major camps that that come out of um Stanislavski's theories Mm -hmm. so just to give you a little bit of backstory for those of you who have not read the book yet uh, um Stanislavski's ideas really come to the United States in the 1920s, in the early 1920s, uh, as a direct result of the Russian Civil War. Um, some of the members of, the, of his company, the Moscow Art Theater, emigrate to the United States because they can't stay in Russia, mm-hmm. and because the theater company's out of money and political, the political temperature's getting too hot, they go on tour of the United States at exactly the same time. Um, and then those ideas really take over American theatrical and eventually cinematic practice. Um, But there's three major camps that grow out of that in the United States, one belonging to Lee Strasberg, one belonging to Stella Adler, and one belonging to Sanford Meisner. They all have very similar goals. And in a weird way, it's the, the, what is it? What is it called? The narcissism of small differences or what what is that phrase? The, Uh, yeah, yeah. something like that. But the other reason why the debates between those three things are so heated is that Strasberg, Adler, and Meisner were in a theater company together, and Adler and Meisner despised Lee Strasberg. They uh-huh. spent the rest of their lives telling anyone who wanted to ask, any interviewer they would go on the record, that he was he had perverted Stanislavski's ideas, he was a tyrant, he was a mentally ill man who was inflicting his sickness on American actors, he was a charlatan, you know, et cetera. And then he would give interviews where he wouldn't mention them by name. Mm-hmm. He would say like an actor I once worked with feels this way, you know. Um, but anyway, all that, here's the idea. Strasberg's um, theory, which is really what, what for most of the 20th century is the capital M method is him. And it is this idea of unlocking the individuality of that actor using as much of their own material as possible, unlocking their idiosyncrasy, unlocking their personal emotions, their psychology, bringing all of that to bear on the character. Um, The core of it is a series of exercises. I won't describe all of them, but the, the most famous or infamous one of which is the effective memory exercise, which is where if I wanted Glenn to, uh, you know, experience, if Glenn wanted to experience grief uh, on stage, you know, he would sit with me and he would get relaxed in his chair and I'd be like, okay, Glenn, close your eyes. And I want you to think of a time in your life when you felt really intense grief. And I don't want you to tell me the story of that, I just want you to tell me the sensory details of it. What did the room smell like? What was the texture like? What did it sound like? And Glenn would start recounting all these things. And sure enough, he would trigger himself. And then he would start feeling grief. And if he got, you know, really good at that, when he was on stage, you know, he would eventually go the beep of a hospital monitor. And that would all, that's all he would have to think. And he would start crying. That's the, the most famous one. Um, also key to Strasberg's approach is the suppression of emotion that in extra, like people don't express how they feel all the time. They keep a lid on it. So in rehearsal and exercises, you let the emotion out, but then when it comes time to work, the character is fighting that emotion. And then, it, you know, um, so that's, that's Strasberg. Adler's whole thing was the imagination and that the, actually the actor had to enlarge their soul in order to be worthy of meeting the soul of the character, earning the right to play the part is how she would talk about it. And you did that 
through really extensive research. You did that, you would look at, you know, if you were playing a character in the 19th century, you would look at 19th century paintings to see how they stood. You would think about how they talk. You would read everything by the author. You would read a biography of the author. You might read a history. And, you know, if your character's a fisherman, you would read fishing manuals. You might try fishing, who knows? So that you could as truthfully as possible affect that behavior on stage. And through that imagination and that in-depth script analysis would be the way that you, you were alive in the present moment. And, it's, mm -hmm. and the script analysis, which she really pioneered, is really focused on questions of what does this character want? What is in the way of them getting what they want? And what are they doing in order to get it? Um, Meisner is, very, is probably the most different from the other two. His whole thing is living truthfully in imaginary circumstances. And he wanted to strip away all received notions of behavior. You know, what is good acting? Don't worry about that. What is, you know, what, what he wanted you to do is be really present in the moment with your scene partner, really alive to the inspiration of the moment of what they are doing. And it's like a tennis match between the two of you. Mm -hmm. And his most famous exercise was a thing called the repetition exercise. And Glenn, why don't we do this real quick? Sure. Um, uh, I want you to just, just say a, a neutral, you know, not particularly interesting short sentence to me uh the dog is on the sofa 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 and then uh the whole point is to do that back and forth and not try to do anything you just start from nothing mm -hmm. and then uh eventually this would build over the course of a whole year of study into something much more elaborate where i would be starting with some activity that was high stakes and then Glenn would knock on the door in such a way that I had to answer it. And then he would just shout something at me and I would shout it back at him and the whole scene would develop out of these repetitions. Um, and so he was really all about how do you be the most present in the moment as possible and not worry about being a character. Don't, don't worry about any of that shit. Just be alive to what's going on. Right. And because these folks didn't agree on what Stanislavski said, or at least interpreted it differently, they have different accounts of uh, common meetings. Like there's a meeting between Stanislavski and Adler, and we don't know what happened because they both tell very different stories about it. And your job is to impose uh, a history, a, na a narrative structure over the chaos of all this going on. And you always have to know where people are coming from because it's it, it crops up so subtly in people's accounts. The difference between saying, Daniel Day-Lewis asked that he be called Lincoln versus Daniel Day-Lewis demanded he be called Lincoln. Right. You, 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 that is so, the verb waits the entire, you get, you get where people are coming from. And there's something I wanted to ask you about. In America, we love our actors, we venerate them, uh, but there is, I think, embedded in the American psyche, a distrust of the whole affair. Um, yes. We seem so eager to mock them, tear them down when, and I think this is probably a result of our puritanical roots, maybe, when we start to think they're getting self-indulgent or they're self-aggrandizing. Mm -hmm. And self-indulgence has been the classic knock against the method from its root, from the beginning, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, one person's fulsome emotion is another person's self-indulgence, right? I mean, sure. you know, the, the method the reason why that was a knock against it at the beginning is that what had come before was not about lived truth. It was not about the, com the complex truth of being a human being and putting that on stage. It mm -hmm. was about stage convention and it was mm -hmm. about oratorical displays. Uh, if you want to give any, I mean, if you want to see an example of this, rent Laurence Olivier's film of Hamlet. If you mm -hmm. want to see what 19th century acting was like, because right. the entire time, you know, when Hamlet's talking about suicide, Olivier is like, you know, and he's taking it. And, yep. and, you know, he's doing these sort of, I mean, it's almost like a, a music recital hearing him recite the ver verse. It's amazing, but it doesn't feel truthful. That truth right. isn't its goal. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the method was replacing that with actually it's about truth. And that made a lot of people uncomfortable. And mm -hmm. it is uncomfortable to see what really looks like someone really going to pieces in front of you. Uh, on stage or on screen. Mm -hmm. And it also did lead to a lot of, you know, in fairness, extremely indulgent behavior. And we still, we hear lots of stories about it. Yeah. Um, I think that obviously um, there's ways in which it's used as an excuse by people to 
um, be their worst selves and mm -hmm. to indulge the worst parts of themselves. I'm not, I'm not going to defend that. But I also think this is sort of the dialectic of the book in some ways. But I also think that we as Americans are very hostile to anyone taking themselves too serious or taking something what we think of as too seriously, you right. know? And I actually think that it was very important that someone come along and say, actually acting is an important art form and it should be taken seriously. I find that very moving. Right. If we were to go back in time, Isaac, and see uh, Sarah Bernhardt perform, mm -hmm. would we recognize it? I mean, you, you kind of touched on this with uh, the 19th century, the Laurence Olivier style. Is it uh, outside in style um, yeah. technique versus truth, I guess? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Sarah Bernhardt, um, who's, you know, one of the greatest actors of all time. Uh, uh, but her version of acting was very big. It was very presentational. Mm -hmm. It was very physical. It was very vocal. You know, it was about big gestures to let you know what the emotions were. You know, she came to prominence at a time where you could literally buy a book of theatrical poses Right. And then learn how to act by doing those poses in front of a mirror. Um, and so uh, um, no knock on her brilliance, but that's sort of what it was like. It's, it's, it's very um, similar in some ways to what opera is still like today. Uh, right. Some okay. opera, some opera. Uh, um, and I like opera. So again, I'm not dinging any of this. It's just, this is what came before. Um, and, and the reason why it's similar is actually for similar reasons, for one of the reasons, which is that she was playing in a thousand plus seat houses mm -hmm. with no amplification and no electric light. So how do you make sure the person in the back row of the balcony knows what the character is going through? You have to do something really big for that. So part of what led to the um, emergence of a more naturalistic style is technological change. Theaters getting smaller, electrically lit, eventually microphones, film cameras, you know, things like that uh, um, uh, affect this as much as theory, you know? Absolutely. So to talk about Brando, we, we started with Brando. Um, sure. In describing the, the sea change that Brando represented to modern understanding of, of, of acting and what the method was, even though he wasn't method, you really have your work cut out for you because his style of acting has in the decades since been so imitated and outright mocked, it's background noise right now to us. Yeah. So your job was to delineate, and I think you did a great job in that excerpt, uh, delineating you. what was different. It, mm -hmm. He came to represent the, me the method, even though he wasn't. He was, I guess, intuitive. You make a great, there's a great uh, anecdote in there about the difference between him and Jessica Tandy in Streetcar Named Desire, um, it's not just his ability to, to throw away dialogue. It's not just, you know, that he was mumblecore before mumblecore or shoegaze before shoegaze. He <laughs> had, an, a, 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 I guess, an instinctive gift that people like Jessica Tandy had to work hard to match, yeah. right? Yeah, totally. Um, well, first of all, thank you for all of those compliments. I worked really hard at that aspect of this, mm -hmm. so I appreciate it. I mean, Brando, after A Streetcar Named Desire, the film, and particularly the film of On the Waterfront, every young man who moved to New York City wanted to be Marlon Brando. And right. they would, every young man who wanted to be an actor imitated him. And you can look at film performances from that time and you can really see it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and eventually it turned to mockery, but there was a, the, you know, before it was mockery, it was tribute. It was everyone wanted to kind of talk like this and, you know, be mumbling and just what I want to do. And you can actually see if you look at Brando's career in chronological order that he's trying to move away from that pretty quickly. He's like, actually, I want to do Julius Caesar. I want right. to put on a bunch of prosthetics and play Zapata, you know, which is a regrettable film. Don't actually watch that one. Or, you know, he tries doing accents in the 60s. He's always wearing wigs. You know, he, he really wanted to, you can see that he's haunted by that legacy almost immediately. Um, in trying to delineate him, I think it's helpful for one thing to watch A Streetcar Named Desire because he really, you can see how he's doing something different from everyone else in that film. Mm -hmm. Whereas by the time you get to Waterfront, everyone's trying to get on his page. <laughs> um, uh, but the other thing is, you know, lots of people wrote about him at the time because it was something new. And if you can get those quotes and tell those stories, you can bring the reader into those eyes. And so to get to Jessica Tandy, who called him 
a psychopathic bastard, just to be very clear. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, the problems with Brando's approach were legion. He would improvise lines because he, because of his dyslexia, he had a horrible time memorizing lines. Um, he, but he would also improvise lines because he would get bored. He mm -hmm. would never do the performance the same way twice. He would step on people's lines. He would do comic business and upstage people. You know, he was kind of a mercurial trickster. Um, and being in a stage play requires, and this is still true, that you do the same thing every night so that every other person could do your job. And so Tandy was actually right about that, I feel like, on some level. Mm -hmm. But the problem was, was that he was also better than everyone else. And so it creates this huge issue for that production. Uh, it, it gets so bad that, um, I mean, Tandy's not the only one arguing about it. Carl Malden has a screaming match with him at some point because he can't figure out where his cues go in his scenes as Mitch because Brando's always doing something different. But, you know, no one was really on their side. Even Jessica Tandy's husband, Hume Cronin, said to Kazan, I know Brando is doing better than her. Don't give up on her. She can do it, just keep working. But, you know, Tandy was a classically trained English. She was English, a lot of people forget that. And she was a classically trained actress who had worked with Olivia and Gielgud. And that was where she came from, was that classical tradition. Um, and so part of what's thrilling about that is the clash between Stanley and Blanche becomes the clash between the new American naturalism and the classic British technique. And that meta conflict actually deepens and enriches the conflict between the characters. Although I can't imagine, I mean, can you imagine being in a play for two years and your co-star is doing something different every time you get on stage? It would drive you nuts, right? No, but Malden emerges in the book as kind of a guy who gets it. He's like, yeah. uh, I, I, I can't compete with it. I can just be alongside it. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's yeah. It. And there's something about Brando, even late in his career, Superman the movie, uh, where he got paid, you know, higher than anybody else. And he had his lines taped to the baby, whatever. Uh there's a moment when he is just talking to the camera and he says, here in this, this fortress of solitude, and you think he came up with it right then. Yes. <laughs> you actually believe that he came up with the term fortress of solitude. Okay. And in a, go... uh, the, yeah. the I could have been a contender speech, he rearranged a bunch of clauses of that speech on the fly to make it seem like, and that's part of what makes it seem more spontaneous, is mm -hmm. that he's actually rewriting the monologue on the fly while he's, while he's delivering it. Amazing. Now, um, I'm going to ask one more question, then we're going to take it to the, oh, uh, the Q&A. Talk to me about Kim Stanley. That's a name oh. I had heard of, but because she made only, what, like six films? I was six not films. familiar with her work. Six, Yeah, so I was not familiar with her work. She emerges uh, from the book as a, a really formidable talent. Talk to me about her. Yeah, well, first of all, I will say, if you read this book and you're interested in Kim Stanley, there's a wonderful biography of her called The Female Brando, because that was actually what she was called in during her life. Kim Stanley was, during the height of her career, the most highly regarded American stage actress, period. Mm -hmm. Maybe stage actor of either gender. I mean, people, I've interviewed lots of people who saw her on stage and they were like, it's just unbelievable. It is, un it actually, it's almost, Austin Pendleton I spoke to for a very long time and he had seen her act and he had also acted with her and he was like, I can't even describe what she did. It was mm -hmm. so off the wall, it was so mm -hmm. off the charts. So here's the problem if you wanna see her work, most of her best work was in on stage or in live TV drama. And oh, right. a lot of live TV drama is very hard to see because it um, either wasn't preserved or it was preserved in the form of kinescopes, which mm -hmm. for those of you who don't know what a kinescope is, it's that you literally pointed a 16 millimeter film camera at the TV <laughs> while the live TV drama was being uh, broadcast. They were not recorded independently by the studios. And so um, there's a collection that Criterion put out that you can see a couple of her appearances on. Some of them are on YouTube. You can go to the Paley Center uh, in New York and see some of them. But she also only made six movies. Um, and she struggled very deeply with uh, mental illness and alcoholism in a way that derailed her career. So um, mm -hmm. in 1964, she does her final stage performance in The Three Sisters um, in London. And then she has so such a problem with drinking that she becomes unemployable and she moves out west for the lost years. And then she has a late in life comeback. She comes back to New York City as an acting teacher. She's among other people, Jessica Lang's uh, acting teacher. And she does a couple more movies. She's the bartender in The Right Stuff, 
uh, if you feel like watching the right stuff. She does a wonderful TV film of, uh, of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Um, and then she just kind of disappears again. And so it's a really sad case. And there are many people who blame the method for the problems that she had. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's true. I think there's a way in which the method is probably responsible both for the highs and the lows on, to some extent, um, but getting to tell at least the chunk of her story that was relevant to the method and getting to watch as much of her work as I could mm -hmm. was, was really a wonderful part of doing this process. Yeah, I, again, it's a name I wasn't familiar with, but I'm going to be now. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right, we're going to go to uh, watcher questions, viewer questions. First one is from Ashley. How does the theory of the method apply to child actors who may not have much life experience to draw on? I'm thinking of Vincent Minnelli telling Margaret O'Brien allegedly that her dog died to get her to cry during Meet Me in St. Louis, but it could be any child actor and any production. Yeah, uh, Ashley, thank you. That's, that's a good question. There's actually a story about, there's one example of that in my book which was um, Aaliyah Kazan, who trained with Lee Strasberg. He was part of the group theater. And he didn't want to use a bunch of exercises to get to people's memories. What he would do instead is get to know everything about them and then subtly manipulate them. That was his, very charmingly manipulate them. That was his process. And so when he was making um, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, uh, where the daughter has this kind of intense relationship with her alcoholic father. Kazan mm -hmm. had found out that the, that the actress playing the daughter, um, her father was overseas in World War II. And he would just slowly kind of talk to her until he dropped hints that her father might not be coming back. He might die in the war. And then she would get really upset and they'd roll the cameras and she'd just, you know, they, and he would get what he needed for filming. And he mm -hmm. sort of didn't, you know, he says in his memoir, I was, I'm absolutely proud of what I did because I got the most truthful performance then. Right. Um, as a parent and a former <laughs> child actor, uh -huh. that's, that's, that's tough, man. I don't, I don't know how I, how I feel about that, to be completely honest. When I was a child actor, that was definitely not what, you know, um, Joy, who comes from a Stanislavski background, that's not how she worked with me, for example. It's much more about imagination and mm -hmm. much more about trying to imagine your way into the character. I think for child, you know, children have such wonderful access to their imaginations and they feel things quickly and deeply. And I think that that's probably the route to go with someone who doesn't have a lot of life experience and also doesn't have the kind of fortitude to use their experience and turn it off. Right. And boy, we really have, we're hypersensitive to dishonesty, I guess, or, or precociousness in child actors. Yes. Like the, the kid in, um, come on, come on, is fantastic. They said there's a naturalism there. Oh my God. But you could pick point to another kid of the same age and, and just, uh, it, it yeah. doesn't, it doesn't. Also scan he's me. English. The kid, in, yeah. come on, come on. Yeah. I, I don't know. I just, I'm, all, I'm almost jealous of how good that kid was. All right. The next question is from Chad, uh, Neil, sorry, Neil. What would an informed person who doesn't subscribe to the Stanislavski approach uh, to acting say are the disadvantages of these approaches, and what do you think of that criticism? Uh, Streep, let's let's talk Streep here because yeah, let's talk she's Streep a person who does not subscribe. She does not subscribe to it. Streep is uh, Meryl Streep is someone who, as far as I mean, from what she said in interviews and things like that, actually reinvents her technique over and over and over again for the specific um, mm -hmm. um, show. So that's one of the critiques of it. Another critique of it is again, like, why do you need to go and use your trauma? <laughs> you know, yep. um, uh, uh, being a character, you're being a character, it's make believe, it's pretend, you need to do what you need to do to, to pretend. There are other critiques of it as well, which have to do with um, being a supportive collaborator of your scene partners. A lot of times right. the Stanislavski process leads to the opposite of that because there, it, it can be really self-involved. Um, when Stanislavski is at the Moscow Art Theater and he starts experimenting with what he called the system, which is what becomes the method in the United States, um, his rehearsal process, he's got longer and longer and longer. His production of Hamlet rehearsed for three years. So yeah. it's just not practical. There's a practical argument against it. There's a taste argument against it that that kind of fully experienced thing is in poor taste. Um, that's probably the argument I'm least sympathetic to, frankly. Um, and then... Um, Another is that, you know, it doesn't serve the text, but the point mm -hmm. of the, the goal of the actor is to serve the text and to serve the writing and its style. That is absolutely the English critique of the method and of Stanislavski. 
Um, Brian Cox has said that a bunch in interviews that, you know, in the middle of the 20th century, there's kind of this separation and Americans go into psychology and emotion and the Brits go into like really just thinking about the text and trying to do what the text means. Um, yeah, so, and, and I think all those critiques have all sorts of validity. I mean, there's great British performances. There's terrible method performances. There's also the opposite. And so mm -hmm. um, uh, I tried to give voice to those critiques within the book and to treat them seriously and honestly and give sort of enough space for the reader to come to their own conclusions. And, and uh, this next question kind of touches on where we are now in, in America with the method. It has been, uh, uh, this is from Drew, where do methods employed by John Hausman and company at the Juilliard School fall in terms of the techniques of Adler, Kazan, Meisner, Strasberg. So they're, they're, really, they're the other, the other, uh, the other shop, right? Yeah, yeah, and I mean, truthfully, since 1980, the Juilliard approach has been ascendant, and mm -hmm. the method approach has not. Um, although we now live in a time where it's sort of a grab bag of approaches, right. but. Um, you, you will actually, if you read the book, get the story of the founding of Juilliard and the codification of its approach from the people who, who did it, because I interviewed some of those folks. Um, and what the Juilliard approach really is, is a marriage of classical theatrical technique and training mm -hmm. and Stanislavski. Um, it's actually both. Michael Kahn, who I'm sure many of you in the audience know Michael and know his work because he was the artistic director of the Shakespeare Theater for many, many years, mm -hmm. including when I was growing up, who was also the head of acting at Juilliard, um, was trained by Lee Strasberg. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, uh, he was a directing student of Lee Strasberg's. He observed at the actor's studio for many years. And I asked him, I was like, did you use Strasberg's exercises? And he was like, of course I used effective memory. Of course I used private moment, yes. Um, but at the same time, they had British vocal training. Moni Yakim, an Israeli clowning teacher, um, came and did movement and actually still, or at least until recently, works with Oscar Isaac on every role that Oscar Isaac does to master the physicality. So it, what, what Juilliard was really doing was trying to not be dogmatic and grab from the best of all of these approaches. And I, I think it worked out, but it is worth saying in the early years of those actors coming out of Juilliard, it was the opposite critique of the early years of the method that these actors spoke too well mm -hmm. and they were too precise and that they were cold and it was neck up acting. Right. And it took a while before that, that critique started to, to fade. You know, but like when Kevin Klein's first performing outside of Juilliard, they're like, uh, is he really feeling these things? So it shows you how um, these pendulum swings happen you know, that, 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 that it becomes bad to speak precisely in the 70s, even though it's bad to speak imprecisely in the 50s. Right. And, and that stuff is changing so much that it's just, it's a, a testament to your ability to, to chart them as effectively yeah. as you do. Because well, even you. people who do the method are confused by what it actually is. And, and uh, but you will not emerge from this book confused. This, I think this is going to be probably, yeah, let's look at that. The last question. Uh, this is from Peter. Uh, and this is something, you know, I said you didn't put your thumb on the scale, uh, but when it comes to the different personalities, I think I can detect how you feel about this one guy. Every person I have ever talked to who knew Strasberg, Lee Grant, Jack Garfield, Anna Berger, Carol Baker, et cetera, couldn't stand him. I know there are people yeah. that loved him, like Ellen Burstyn, but it seems like most people land in the former camp. In your research, did you dig up what the issue was with him? Was he just hard on people or was he really deep down a terrible dude? I don't know that he was a terrible dude. He was a deeply unpleasant human being. There's just, there's, there's no, I mean, I actually think that's objectively true that he was a okay. deeply unpleasant human being. I don't know if that's my thumb on the scale, but I've read so many accounts, including in books written by his protégés who are like, he's deeply difficult to deal with. And I don't know. I mean, you know, um, he had very, very few social graces um, in a way that he seemed mystified by the necessity of them. There's a quote in my book that comes from a biography of him where he's like, I don't understand why people say hello. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of in my life. Why would you say hello to someone? What does goodbye even mean? What is that? You know, he seemed like genuinely mystified by the normal things that we think of as necessary to oil the gears of human relationship. And if you watch footage of his classes, he's often like screaming at people. I mean, he could go from zero to enraged like that. He did not like being defied. He knew he was a genius and he did not brook disagreement well. 
there are lots of people. Ellen Burstyn's a perfect example. Shelley Winters is another. Mm -hmm. um, Marilyn Monroe, uh, who were extremely devoted to him and loved him. I got an email recently from someone who he took under his wing and uh, uh, anointed his godson. Even though he wasn't religious, he was like, this is my godson, you know, whoever. So there are those people out there, but even people who were friends of his were like, I'm his yeah. close friend. He's so unpleasant. I mean, it's a very weird thing. Um, I'll also say that there are periods in the 20th century where interpersonal conflict is much more celebrated than it is today. That's if true. you read the accounts of the group theater, you know, they made all this art together. They created this acting style together. Um, and they basically screamed at each other for a decade straight. I can't imagine being in a theater company where people are literally throwing chairs at each other when they disagree. But they mm -hmm. would do that and then they would come back the next day and get to work or they would get drunk or they would sleep together. They just didn't have those kinds of boundaries. And so I think especially reading it from the, the accounts of Strasbourg from the vantage point of today, it's just like, whoa, that is inappropriate. And that is the part I tried to resist. I tried to resist that presentist bias and to present him the way the, the people who knew him felt about him. Well, I think you did that remarkably well. And I was gonna conclude this by uh, asking you the 10 questions that uh, uh, James Lipton used to ask folks, but I'm not gonna do that. Are you oh, sure? We'll, we'll just, yeah, let's do my it. Favorite quick, curse, you know what my favorite curse word? Uh, uh, real quick, <laughs> what's your favorite word? What's my favorite word? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, I don't yes, know that I, comes... I... Yeah, no, no, that's the Proust questionnaire. What's the, there's words that I overuse in the book. So I'm trying to think of, of 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 uh, one of those. Oh, ephemeral, ephemeral. Good. Let's say Excellent. ephemeral. Yeah. Least favorite word. Um, lazy. Okay. What turns you on emotionally, spiritually, intellectually? Great art. What turns you off? Um, bore bad food. Interesting. What sound or noise do you love? Uh, my daughter's laughter. Aw. What sound or noise do you hate? Um, the brakes of the subway train in New York City. What is your favorite curse word? Motherfucker. Uh, that's a good one. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Uh, musician. Oh, okay. What profession would you not like to do? Um, sanitation worker. Yeah, solid. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? I've read your books. Ah, it's a good one. It's a good one. <laughs> that, of course, was the questions by French television personality Bernard Bibo on his show Apostrophe. They to bouillon the cook. Let's uh, throw it back to our folks at uh, Politics and Prose. Thank you so much, Isaac. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you, Glenn. Oh, that was that was such a delightful closer. Um, I I do have to ask though. So. We are a bookstore, so and we're always interested in what our guests are currently reading and what you guys would like to suggest. Um, either of you can start. Oh, great! Yeah, that's great. I would uh, I, I would say um, I just I'll, I'll give you two recommendations because mm -hmm. uh, I'm reading two books right now. One is a science fiction book called Semiosis. Glenn, have you read Semiosis? Nope. It's, it's great. I'm listening to it right now as an audiobook while I walk my dog. Uh, it's about colonists on a planet uh, where the plants are sentient. So it's humans trying to learn how to think like plants and interact with them and not go to war with them. And then I'm uh, rereading Iris Murdoch's brilliant novel, The Bell, which if oh, you're right. a fan of Middlemarch, mm -hmm. go pick up The Bell. It, it'll give you that same feeling, but is less than half as long. Uh, uh, so, so there you go. Um, that that would be that that's that's what I would go for. What about that's you, Glenn? Uh, I am listening to George Saunders a swim in a pond in the rain, uh, which is basically <laughs> his short story like seminar that he gives uh, where he teaches, right. which basically looking at four Russian authors it speaks very. It's in conversation with your book. Uh, four Russian authors of short stories: Chekhov, Turgenev, Gogol. One more. And it's basically breaking it down, breaking it down to the, the essentials of how you affect, how you get your reader to be legitimately surprised um, in a way that is rewarding. Uh, it's, it's just, it's such a precise and uh, ultimately he's fanboying out over Chekhov and <laughs> Gogol. So it's really cool. It's fun to I fan out over Chekhov and Gogol. So that's great. <laughs> uh, we love when our favorite fan 
over our favorites and you know it's just wonderful seeing artists just plan over each other um yeah on that note um thank you so much for sh- spending your time your weekend um thank you to you both for sharing your stories with us this was such a delightful conversation and thanks to everyone who came by tonight we definitely appreciate you coming by here your patronage is what enables us to bring you such great conversations like this and we cannot continue to host these types of events without your support so once again there is a link in the chat to purchase isaac butler's the method and again we got book plates don't forget to check out our website for the most up-to-date event listings as we have an amazing list to choose from isaac glenn thank you for your wonderful insights your stories um this is thank so you great so much. and thank you we do hope to see you all soon under much safer circumstances and Thanks again. Um, We hope this was a great kickoff to your weekend. And so stay safe, stay warm, and 